Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Simon Ritter. I'm the Deputy CTO of Azure Systems. What we're going to be talking about today is how to migrate from the Oracle JDK to Azure's open JDK called Zulu and really talk about just how easy it is to do that. Now, before we get started, a couple of things in terms of housekeeping. Um, the first is that the slides for today's presentation will be sent to everybody after the end of the webinar, and we'll also send you a link for a recording of this webinar as well. So if you want to share it with your friends, your family, or your colleagues, then you can do so very happily. If you do have questions, then we'll address those at the end. So please feel free to type those into the Q&A box on the side of the GoToWebinar system. So with that, um, let's get started. As I say, the idea is to talk about how easy it is to migrate from Oracle to Azul's Zulu. Because one of the things that I frequently find when I talk to potential customers is that they're concerned about the amount of work that's involved moving from one version of Java to another, and specifically, you know, between Oracle and Azul. And really what we want to do with this presentation is to reassure you that this is not a difficult thing to do. It doesn't involve a lot of work. It doesn't involve a lot of cost. So it is very straightforward and simple. And so to sort of kick things off, what I'd like to do is introduce Leonardo Lima, who is with us today. He's from Techstone. He's the chief architect. So Leo, would you like to say a few things about your yeah, experiences? Hi, I'm yeah, so I'm Leo. I've been working with Java for 15 years. And during those 15 years, I've done the, one of migrations that Simon has said, not only migrating versions as in 6, 7, and 8, but also between vendors, right? And that's, that's where the Java ecosystem is really strong. Migrating Java vendors is not hard at all because Java is a standard, and we can just point to another binary that, that goes to the either Oracle or Azul, for example, and then you're off. And 99% of the, the time, it will work perfectly. What, with that 1%, what will not work perfectly, will be going to be like just minor details that are, I believe Simon's going to cover them now. And uh, it's very corner cases. But on my experience, migrating both embedded versions of Java and also server-side versions, it, it's either changing Java home to point to this new binary or change a Docker image, uh, base image, right? So you say from and X, and you say just from Zulu, for example, and then it will already cover everything. So it's really straightforward. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Right, so let's start by talking a bit about what we at Azul do in terms of providing what we call the Zulu JDK and why you would think about moving to that, why it is a, a, an exact alternative in terms of the Oracle JDK. So the first thing to understand is that we take the same starting point that Oracle do. So we take Open JDK source code as the thing that we're going to build Zulu from. And that's really important because Open JDK is a project that was started back in 2007. It was Sun Microsystems who originally released the source code for their implementation of the JDK, made it available for people to use, to modify, to build on as an open source project. And so what we do is we take, as I said, the exact same starting point that Oracle do. We then use the same build scripts that Oracle do in order to generate the binary distribution of the JDK that we can provide to our customers. Now, that on its own gives you a high level of confidence that what you're getting is an identical product to Oracle. But to go even further than that, make sure that you're really confident that we are delivering an exact replica, if you like, we have these things called the TCK tests. And every build that we create, we run this TCK testing suite on those builds. Now, the TCK stands for the Technology Compatibility Kit. It's part of the Java standard. And so each version of Java has its own standard. It's defined through the Java community process. There is what's called a JSR, Java specification request for each different version. And a JSR consists of three different things. So the first part is the specification itself. And what that tells you in the case of Java SE is the syntax for the Java language. It tells you about all the core class libraries that are included in Java 
and it defines what the Java virtual machine has to do in terms of executing applications through bytecodes. So that's the first part is the, the specification itself. The second part is a reference implementation. So it's proof that you can actually implement that standard. And the reference implementation in the case of Java SE is OpenJDK. So we've got standard, we've got OpenJDK as our source code. And then the third part is these things called the TCK tests. It's a test suite which is used to verify that the code that you build actually matches the standard and conforms exactly to the standard. It's very rigorous. It consists of over 150,000 tests. And as I say, that gives you this very high level of confidence that what you're getting in terms of executing an application, any OpenJDK build, which has passed TCK, will run applications in the same way as any other build that's also passed TCK. So you can move from Oracle, TCK tested, to Zulu, TCK tested, and things will work in exactly the same way. Now, from the point of view of providing you with the maximum possible coverage for different applications, what we've done is we've said, right, we are going to go right back to as far as we can in terms of supporting Java. Now, when the OpenJDK project was first created, initially it was Java SE 7 that was the first release. But in order to give people access to an older version, there was a, a sort of backport done for Java SE 6. So we can go all the way back to JDK 6 and deliver binaries for that. If you're still using JDK 6, you can you can use those from Azul. Ones that we support at the moment are 6, 7, 8, which a lot of people are still using. 11 is the current long-term support release as defined by Oracle. And then we also have 13 and 15 supported. And I'll come back and talk a little bit more about that in a moment because those are what we call medium-term support releases. The next thing that we've done is to kind of look at the fact that lots of people are still using JDK 8 and it's taking people quite a long time to migrate from 8 to 11 or later. To sort of help people in that respect, what we've done is we've also backported some more modern features to Zulu 8 so that you can make use of those. And the two things that we've done recently, one is flight recorder support, and that's a set of things that sits inside the JVM that allows you to monitor it using a tool called Mission Control. All of that was made open source in JDK 11. We've then backported it to JDK 8, so you can monitor your systems, look at what threads are being used, how much garbage collection going on, and things like that. The other thing which is possibly more useful is support for TLS 1.3. TLS is the transport layer security, and that's a security protocol that's commonly used in terms of web servers, delivering web pages, web applications, and so on. And in terms of being able to use that, we've tried to make it as simple as possible, so you don't have to change any of your code, you don't have to recompile any of your code. It's simply a command line switch. You can turn it on and say, yes, we want to use TLS 1.3 for our server, and that will then enable you to have better security for your applications. In terms of platform support, clearly we want to make sure that you have all the different versions and all the different platforms supported so that you've got maximum flexibility. In terms of the platforms that we do support, we've got the, the most common ones in terms of Intel 64-bit versions for Windows, for Mac, and for Linux. And then for people who may be using older operating systems, perhaps you're still on Windows XP for some machines, then we can also provide Intel 32-bit versions for both Windows and Linux. Again, we do have some more esoteric platforms that we support. So there's versions available for Spark. There's a PowerPC version, ARM32, ARM64, even MIPS if you wanted it as well. Some of those tend to be used more for the embedded side of things, but if you want to use those, those are available for use uh, for your applications as well. Now, another very important thing in terms of what we deliver as part of the, the Zulu supported product is updates. And if you look at the way that OpenJDK works, there is a quarterly update, four updates each year. We have January, April, July, and October. Yes, there might be a couple of out of bounds ones, some emergency ones that need to be delivered uh, at different times, but primarily we're looking at those four updates. And Again, in terms of what we would provide to you as a customer, we want to give you the exact same thing that you would get from Oracle. So it is a like-for-like -like switch and there's no differences, no complexities involved. 
Part of that is giving you two versions of each update because that's what Oracle does. And as far as I know, nobody else who provides a binary distribution of the JDK does the same thing. So it's just Azul and Oracle that do this. Why is that important? Well, what we do is we provide you with one version, which is called the security only update. If you talk to Oracle, they'd call it the CPU. We don't use that terminology because other people get a bit confused about what these things mean. So we call it the security only update. What that includes is just the changes that are required to address the security vulnerabilities that have been addressed in that particular update. By doing that, we've got a small set of changes because typically there's not many things that need to be addressed. So small set of changes. By doing that, if there is a critical vulnerability, so one with a very high score, and we need to address that quickly and make sure that our systems are secure, then you can use the security only update. You can say, right, let's do some quick testing on our applications, make sure they start up, make sure everything does basically what it's supposed to do, and then deploy that update into your data center and onto your machines. By doing that, you get the maximum level of security protection. So you're immediately avoiding problems with those vulnerabilities. The second version of the update, the full update, contains all of those security fixes, but it also has any other bug fixes, enhancements, any other code changes, which can be quite a lot more. And by providing you this second update, what you can then do is having addressed any vulnerabilities that need to be patched very quickly, you can then say, okay, let's spend a bit more time testing our applications, make sure that none of these changes impact on what our application does, so that when we're happy with that, we can then deploy it into our machines. What that gives you is the maximum level of stability. So the security only update is about maximum security, full update is about maximum level of stability. Now, a lot of people say to me, well, that's really nice and I, I like the idea, but you know, just how important is that? How does it really make any difference? And so the answer is yes, it does. So if we look at a very topical example here, literally the last update that came out in July, 2020, and that had an update, JDK 8 update 252. That was the full update. Now that included a fix to a particular bug that had been reported. And because of the, the way that that fix got integrated into the JDK, it was quite late in the development cycle. And it actually broke some software and that wasn't spotted until after the update had been released. When I say it broke some software, some fairly commonly used application platforms and frameworks, things like Hadoop Cluster, things like Solar, Lucene, they stopped working if you installed JDK 8 update 252. So although they fixed one problem, they actually broke another thing, but with that fix. Clearly, Oracle were made aware of that very quickly after it was made available. And so they set about creating an, an update to the update, but it took 12 days before that new update, update 265, was released with the fix that meant you could then deploy it and use your Hadoop cluster or your Lucene without any problems. If you had had the security only update, update 251, that didn't include the fix which broke Hadoop cluster and so on. And you might have looked at that and you said, okay, there's a, an 8.3 CVSS, so a vulnerability with a high score. It's not, it's not a critical score, but it is quite high. And you might think to yourself, well, you know, we want to make sure that all high or critical vulnerabilities are addressed straight away. So we need to be able to roll out a patch to that. If you'd had the security only update, you could have done that and not broken your Hadoop clusters and your Lucene based machines. So you could have then had security enabled and then waited the 12 days before you then were able to roll out the full update. So that's the important thing you see, because of course that 8.3 vulnerability was made public when update 252 was released. And so it was 12 days where anybody who's like a hacker could have said, oh, I know how to exploit that try and get into people's systems because they know it hasn't been patched. So that's why you need a security only update. In terms of what we offer from a support perspective, what we do is we take the changes that are made to the current release of the JDK. Now, right now that's JDK 15. And in order to provide the support in older versions, we have to take those changes and backport them to the relevant source code base 
for those different versions. And we do that independently. So our engineers take those, backport them, and then we're able to build them, and deliver the, the versions for our users. In terms of how long we do that, for Zulu 8, we're planning on providing a long time because people are taking more time to move off JDK 8 and they want to continue using it, then we at the moment are committing to support it until the end of December 2030. That means you've got over 10 years that you can continue to use JDK 8 with all the security and bug fix updates. For our long-term support releases, and remember that long-term support is something that is an Oracle concept. Open JDK doesn't understand long-term support. So long-term support, something that Oracle created for their JDK and people like Azul and others have followed the same numbering. So we've decided that 11 is a long-term support, 17 will be the next one. But how long that support is for is up to the provider of your Java platform. What we've said is that we will provide nine years of active support for each long-term support release. Active support means that you will get those quarterly updates every three months and they will be made available through our website. We then have a further two years of passive support beyond that, which means that we won't provide you with those regular updates, but in the very unlikely event that during those two years and you're still using that version, you do find a problem in the JDK. Our engineers will look at it, they will find a fix, and then we will provide an individual update to you for that particular bug. Now, I did mention the idea of what we call medium term support releases. The reason we did this was because we looked at long-term support and we said, well, there's three years between each LTS. And it could be that there are some really cool features and things you really want to use between those releases. But you don't want to have to wait 18 months, two years, two and a half years until the next long-term support release. What we will do then is we'll take two of the releases between those. In this case, it's going to be 13 and 15, so every other release and we will provide extended support for those, meaning that you will continue to get quarterly updates in the same way as our long-term support release. But rather than having that for a long time, what we'll do is we'll say, let's provide those updates until 18 months after the next long-term support comes out. That way you've got 18 months to move from, let's say JDK 13 to JDK 17. So it's kind of a, a stepping stone to the next long-term support release. Now, in order to be able to provide all this to our customers, what we want to do as well is to be able to show you that we're in a position to be able to do that very competently. So we do have what I put here as our Java credentials. Obviously, we have a large engineering team. We have a lot of engineers who used to work for Oracle, used to work for Sun Microsystems, have been involved in the development of the, the JVM and the JDK itself. But we go beyond that in terms of our involvement in the wider Java ecosystem. First thing is we're a member of the Java Community Process Executive Committee. This is a group that oversees the definition of the way that the standards work. And so we help with that side of things. We've been in that group since 2011. We're also a member of the Java SE Expert Group. This is the group of companies and individuals who actually decide on the direction of Java in terms of features that are included in each standard. So I represent Azul on this standard and we've been doing that since Java SE 9. Very importantly, Azul is a member of the OpenJDK vulnerability group. And the reason behind this is that when Oracle decided to make changes around its licensing and its distribution of Java, it realized that there were going to be other people providing versions of the Java platform. So to make sure that things remain secure for Java, they created the vulnerability group within OpenJDK. It's a closed group, which means that we don't publish any of our communications. In fact, because we're dealing with security issues, all of our email is encrypted and we don't publish anything so that people don't get any knowledge of what's going on in terms of these vulnerabilities. As a group, we work collaboratively to produce the security patches for any vulnerabilities that are identified. And that means it's not just Oracle engineers who are working on these patches. It's Azul engineers, it's Amazon engineers, it's SAP engineers, and so on. So that's very important. But it also means that for us as a company, we have advanced visibility of all the changes that are required 
for each update. That means that what we can do is we can take the information we have about the patches that we're developing, and then we can do the backporting of those patches. We can also create our builds. We can run all of the TCK tests before Oracle release an update. We don't have to wait for it to come out. We don't have to wait for them to contribute the source code to the relevant project and then do all of that work. What that means is that when Oracle release an update, we are able to provide our update to the customers pretty much simultaneously. Now, we can't literally do it right at the very second that Oracle do. But to give you an idea of how quickly we do, if we look back over the last year and a bit, since Oracle stopped providing public updates to JDK 8, our updates have been made available within one hour of Oracle's update. The slowest we managed was 59 minutes, so we did just get within the hour, and the fastest, I think, was 22 minutes. What that means is there really isn't any time that you're exposed to an, a security issue. There's no day, three days, week, whatever, where people could try and exploit these vulnerabilities. You literally, you've got the update available within an hour, you can deploy it as quickly as you like, and you're secure. We're also involved in other parts of OpenJDK. So we currently, one of our engineers is the lead on the OpenJDK 13 project, and we've just volunteered to take over leadership, or one of our engineers has volunteered to take over leadership of the OpenJDK 7 update project. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about the actual migration process itself. And what we've done is to come up with a three-phase approach to migrating from Oracle JDK to Zulu. First of those is the, the planning phase. And in order to do that, this is the, the part that often takes people the most time. It, because what you need to do is you need to look across all the machines that you're using and do a survey to understand which versions of Java are being used and that could even be to the update level as well, and also which platforms those versions are running on. So what operating system you're using, what hardware you're using, is it 64-bit, is it 32-bit, and so on. And what you need to do is to build up a list of all the machines with all the versions on it so that when you want to do that migration, you know that the simplest approach is to say, let's install like for like. So you've got a machine that's running JDK 7, and so you can migrate that to using Azul JDK 7. If you've got a machine running JDK 8, you move to Azul JDK 8. So you're not having to move to the latest version of Java. You can do like for like versions and keep things as simple as possible. Similarly, you know, making sure that we have all the different versions supported so you know exactly what's going on there. This is also a very good time to, to do a bit of housekeeping, uh, maybe sort of, sort of do some clearing out. So if you've got machines where you find, okay, Java has been installed, but nobody's actually running any applications that use it. So you can remove that and you know, potentially eliminate some problems in terms of maintenance, in terms of um, vulnerabilities and so on, and just kind of tidy up things. Also, it's a good idea to take the opportunity to bring everything up to the latest patch level so you know you've got the maximum security for your systems. Often we find that for big companies, they're already running software asset management systems. And so producing this report can be done quite quickly. For a lot of customers, they're not doing that. So it is a much more manual process and they need to go through and, and check all the different machines. There are some software tools available that can kind of help with that. Um, and there are companies that like uh, Leo's company will uh, help you with that sort of thing as well. They'll say a little bit more about that at the end. Desktop considerations. This is one area where, as Leo mentioned, there, there's sort of some edge cases and some corner cases that can be a little bit tricky. And desktop is one of those. OpenJDK is the open source version of Java, but unfortunately it doesn't include everything that used to be in the Oracle JDK and the Sun JDK before that. And the specific areas that can cause issues are on the desktop. So two things in particular. One is applet support. If you're still running applets within a web browser, I really hope you're not, but I know that some people are. Then the plugin is not open source, so there is no <clears throat> there is no equivalent to that because we provide OpenJDK builds. We don't include the browser plugin in that. 
Similarly, if you're using Java Web Start, which is a different deployment technology, it's sort of uh, halfway between applets and applications. So you install the application on your desktop, and then every time you start it up, it will make a check to where it was downloaded from to see if there's any new files to download. We do have an open source alternative to that. It's called Ice-T Web. Um, it's not a drop-in replacement. It, it does have a little bit of work in terms of configuration and so on, um, but it is a possibility to use that instead of Java Web Start. So as I said, those are not part of OpenJDK, so they're not included in Zulu Enterprise. JavaFX is another big piece that um, was in the Oracle JDK. It was removed as of JDK 11, but because it's a separate project, OpenJFX, we can take that source code, we can build it, and therefore we can provide builds that include JavaFX if you need those. One other very small thing uh, from a desktop perspective is fonts. So the Oracle JDK included some commercial fonts that gave you cross-platform the same look and feel, and we can provide those to you as well as part of what we call our compatibility package. The only thing that you need to bear in mind there is at the moment that is one extra step because you have to in, install that as well as the Zulu JDK. We're actually looking at how to eliminate that so that we can make it part of the same package and you then don't have to do anything extra. Looking at the individual sort of primary operating systems, um, from a, a migration point of view, so having done the analysis and figured out what you need to use, then you need to actually do the migration and install the new versions of Java. As I said, from Windows perspective, it's always a good idea, maybe uninstall old versions, clear out things, create more space on your disk and things like that. From an installation perspective, we provide you with as much flexibility as possible. And again, matching exactly what you would have got from Oracle. There are two different ways you can install on Windows. First is if you want to do a manual install where you're going to use a particular directory where you want to put your JDK, you can use a zip file format that we can provide for that. You simply put the file on your machine, unzip it, then get rid of the zip file and you're done. If you want an automatic install, there is an MSI format file that we can provide which has an installer that will update things like the registry so that the version of Java is picked up automatically and we'll put it into the right directory in terms of the programs directory and so on. Linux, similar kind of thing. So there are two different possibilities there. Manual install, for that we use a different format file. So we've got a compressed tar file. And then for the automated install, there are two different files that come with installers. So there's either the RPM file or the Debian file, depending on which distribution of Linux you're using, then you can make use of either or both of those, depending on which one you want to use. Uh, just a couple of notes about Linux installations. If you look at Linux distributions, you will find that there is a directory called slash USR slash lib slash JVM. And that's where Linux distributions install Java. So if you go and you use the repo from Ubuntu, for example, and you ask for the OpenJDK, then that's where it will get installed. For Zulu Enterprise, we will also install in that directory. So you will find when you install Zulu 8, there's a user lib JVM, Zulu 8 AMD64, or something like that directory created. Oracle does not do that. So it is just one thing to bear in mind. That they use a different directory for where they put the JDK. So they put it in slash user slash Java, and you'll find something like JDK 1.8.0 and so on. Just a very minor thing to bear in mind with Linux. MacOS, uh, again, two different ways of doing it. If you want to do a manual install, then we will provide you with either a compressed tar file or a zip file, whichever you prefer to use. And we can provide you with the automated install which is a DMG file, so it's a disk image format, and that will install into the standard directory slash library slash Java slash Java virtual machines so that your applications can pick up their Java from there. Having installed the JVM, then the only other thing that you need to do is to check whether there's anything in terms of changing environment variables to point at where the new installation is. From a, a command line flag point of view, there's nothing to worry about. We build from the same source code, so all of the flags that you have supported on the Oracle JDK, with one exception, are supported on Zulu JDK. The only exception is that Oracle has this unlock commercial features flag. 
since we don't have commercial features in OpenJDK, we don't have that flag. Doesn't matter. So even if you had a script that used it, it will just be ignored by Zulu JDK, and it means that it doesn't prevent the system from starting up. Really, the only thing that you would have used with that is Flight Recorder. And as I said, we've already backported that to JDK 8, so you can use that as well if you want to. And then last thing, as I said, is just about environment variables. If you've got a Java Home set up, so if you're running something like Tomcat, then you may have to change Java Home to point at the new installation directory. The third phase, completing migration, is really just about testing. So what you want to do is having moved to the Oracle JD, from the Oracle JDK to the Zulu JDK, then run whatever tests you have for your application. What we recommend is to run as much testing as possible. If you've got regression tests, run all of those. Make sure your applications run in the way that they, you expect them to. All of the, the sort of various things that you want to make sure that your applications are doing what they expect them to do. Now, as I've said, there really shouldn't be any problems. And uh, what I've got here is some anecdotal migration results. And I'm sure that uh, Leo can, can add to this a little bit at the end. So what we found is that, you know, hand on heart, no customers that we've had, and there are literally hundreds of customers who've made the migration from Oracle to Azul. None of those customers have ever reported an issue that's as a result of some different functionality or some different way that the Zulu JDK works compared to Oracle. And it really is very, very straightforward. We've had people as big as Salesforce have made the migration and they've run all their applications and nothing has caused them any problem. We have other very large customers, people like Workday, um, eBay, Starbucks, lots and lots of big banks and so on. And again, one sort of example I've given you here, which is that uh, we have one bank in Australia who migrated two and a half thousand JBoss applications from Oracle to Zulu in a weekend. And um, because nothing changed, it was just a straightforward, right, run the application, run the tests, it's all good. And they haven't looked back since. Just to summarize then what we've been talking about, um, migrating to Zulu Enterprise is really easy. Um, you know, it's easier than you think. Yes, it is very, very easy. The vast majority of the applications will migrate directly. The only areas where you have to give any considerations if you're using desktop, if you're using applets, if you're using web start. And that's the only place where you're going to have to think a little bit about, you know, how to, to make that migration and what you need to do for that. From the, the Zulu perspective, we provide you with all the standard platforms, all the standard formats. So from a, a process perspective, it really is the same as using whatever you would do to deploy a new version or new update of the Oracle JDK. You can simply use the same thing, but use Zulu instead. And I put a quote here from one of our customers who said that switching from Oracle JRE to Azul Zulu was as easy as it can get. Basically a drop-in replacement, thanks to Zulu's certified TCK compliance. Together with Azul's first-class support and substantial cost savings, this is hard to beat. And that kind of sums things up. You know, the fact that it is a drop-in replacement, TCK compliance, we test everything, really does make it very straightforward. So the last thing I want to do is I actually want to give you a demonstration of this so I can show you this working in reality. Now, what I will say before I do the demonstration is it's not very exciting that's what you want. You do not want excitement in your migration. What you want is simply to be able to go, yes, here's my application running. I moved to Zulu. Here's my application running in exactly the same way. So if I switch to my screen here, what I can do is go to my web browser. And what I've done is the first thing I set up was just a, a simple Tomcat application. So I've got a, a Linux box running in my office here. And I wrote a small Tomcat servlet, which takes an airline code, uses some database, MySQL, JDBC, just to make it a little bit more complicated, and then we'll look up an airline code and give you the name of the airline. So if we put BA in and we submit that, what we'll get back is it's British Airways. Great, really exciting application. But what I've also done is to put the information about which version of Java it's using. So you can see it's using Oracle 1.8 and it's update 202, which was the last publicly available update for JDK 8. So if I go to my particular, um, I've SSH'd into my box and save you watching me down, download a file, I've already done it. So we've got Zulu 8 Debian file. And if I install that, 
then it takes a couple of seconds and that's it. So basically I've installed that now. It's gone into user lib JVM, which is the directory that I, I said it would go into. And if I just this that, then you can see we've got Zulu 8 AMD 64. Great. Now, if I go to my Tomcat uh, configuration file and edit that, you see I'm a VI user rather than Emacs, and I change my Java home. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say pick up the Java home as being the Zulu directory rather than the Oracle directory. And if I restart, Tomcat. That just takes a couple of seconds. Restarted Tomcat. If I go back to my web browser and I go back to the place where I have my application, obviously it runs straight away. That's good. And I put in another thing and I submit that. What I find now is I get the result and now it's saying that the Java vendor is all and the version is 1.8 update 265. So it's the latest update I've done that. And you can see it was as easy as that. There was no difficulty in terms of migrating my application. Just one other thing I'll show you here is I also have JBoss, uh, which I can run. So I've got um, set up the, the JBoss. And if I do, actually, let me do this, save myself. Right. So if I run it, the JBoss server in standalone mode, then what we'll do is we just take a couple of seconds to run that up. And then we get to the point, right, okay, so we are now running JBoss as a server. And if I scroll back, what we can see here is in terms of Java, it's user Java AMD 264, 202. Yeah, so that's the, the uh, Oracle Java that we saw before. And then if I go to my web browser, and this time I run the standard JBoss application, Great, so that all runs as we'd expect it to. I can insert some data, it does all the sort of things that JBoss does. Okay, that's running great. Now, what I'll do is I will migrate my application. So if I stop my server here, now what I need to do is change my standalone.conf file. And what we'll find is that we've got Java home again. So if I take that out and put that there. So now I'm saying that Java Home is going to be picking up from our Zulu installation. Now, if I just restart my JBoss instance, and um, it'll take a couple of seconds to do that. And what we'll see is that's gone there. Okay, so now if I scroll back up, can see now that it's Java is picking up from Zulu 8, which is what we want it to do. And if I now go back to my web browser and I run the application again, go back to the application, you can see it works. It's doing what it's supposed to do. I can install the data again and everything works exactly as I should. So like I say, it's really not very exciting because the application works and then the application works. Not really anything particularly exciting there. So that, that is basically everything. So um, let's go back to the, the end of the slides here. And so Leo, um, any other comments, uh, things that you'd like to talk about in terms of migration based on what we've been talking about here? Yeah, I, I think you covered the simplicity with the demo, right? So it's it's a matter of knowing what your application uses as a Java. And that, that's as the hardest part to do the survey, understand, every version you need to and like you did you 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 were using the last publicly available jdk8 now you have security patches built in as well so you are you are doing even an evolution of your java 8 when you do the migration but it's really simple and uh, i didn't face any functionality issues uh in my experience uh the only thing that i would say that's a bit different uh, than, than what you said is when you have desktop applications, because uh, that is harder to configure and you have to deploy, uh, deploying this to all your, for example, all your workers machine is harder than it looks because then you have to tell them to remove it all uh, or do it in an automated way. So that's the harder part. But when it's server applications like that, it's really simple. It's uh, once you know where, where your Java, where your current Java lives and then you replace it, um, it's it's that simple as it did. Just shut down, start again, and it's working. Great. 
Okay, so that's basically the end of the webinar. So let's see now if we've got any questions. Um, just to reiterate um, what I said earlier on about housekeeping, we will be sending out a copy of the slides to everybody who registered. We'll also send you a link to a recording of the webinar. So if you do want to share it with your colleagues or other people, uh, then please do feel free to do so. Um, so we have one question here, which is, are you aware of any performance issues with G1GC garbage collector? We are seeing a total freeze of the whole OS for one of our apps when using Zulu 64-bit. Switching to parallel GC seems to resolve the issue, but we cannot explain why. Now, this is interesting because I, I think you're the customer that I saw who, who um, put a thing on Stack Overflow maybe um, yesterday, um, which we picked up on. And I think the, the interesting thing there is that what you're seeing is probably a result of something that's happening in G1 GC. I don't think it's a Zulu specific issue. Um, very much uh, in terms of this, um, I would want to make sure that if you tested it on the Oracle JDK that you're getting the same issue that you were getting on Zulu JDK. I know that one of our engineers did start looking at this and he came across several um, postings on Stack Overflow that was a similar situation um so we are looking at this um issue specifically because I, I had seen something about this with the the switch from g1 gc to parallel um the way that the garbage collector works it's very difficult to to kind of go from what's been said there um i'm not aware of anything that would would cause a complete freeze of the whole os that that does sound like a fairly major issue because you wouldn't typically expect that um you might see a freeze of the the jvm process but you wouldn't see the whole os freeze up if, if something like that's happening then that is a serious um, problem in terms of jdk related to the os so like i said our, some of our engineers are actually looking at this so hopefully we'll be able to post an answer on stack overflow uh, fairly quickly for that um so i don't see any other questions there so if, if anybody else does have any questions please do feel free to type those in Otherwise, um, I would like to say thank you very much to Leo for joining us today and for giving him his perspective on migration and, and just how easy it is. And so I would say that if you're interested in more details about this, go to our website. Um, you can download Zulu, uh, try it out for free. And then if you're interested in getting the support, uh, we can certainly talk to you about that. So since I don't see any more questions, I'm going to say thank you very much for listening. Thank you.